Section 4 You will hear part of a student presentation about the variety of different species that live in the world's oceans. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I've been looking at ocean biodiversity, that's the diversity of species that live in the world's oceans. About 20 years ago, biologists developed the idea of what they called biodiversity hotspots. These are the areas which have the greatest mixture of species, so, one example is Madagascar. These hotspots are significant because they allow us to locate key areas for focusing efforts at conservation. Biologists can identify hotspots on land fairly easily, but until recently, very little was known about species distribution and diversity in the oceans, and no one even knew if hotspots existed there. Then a Canadian biologist called Boris Worm did some research in 2005 on data on ocean species that he got from the fishing industry. Worm located five hotspots for large ocean predators, like sharks, and looked at what they had in common. The main thing he'd expected to find was that they had very high concentrations of food, but to his surprise, that was only true for four of the hotspots. The remaining hotspot was quite badly off in that regard. But what he did find was that in all cases, the water at the surface of the ocean had relatively high temperatures, even when it was cool at greater depths. So this seemed to be a factor in supporting a diverse range of these large predators. However, this wasn't enough on its own, because he also found that the water needed to have enough oxygen in it. So these two factors seemed necessary to support the high metabolic rate of these large fish. A couple of years later, in 2007, a researcher called Lisa Balance, who was working in California, also started looking for ocean hotspots, but not for fish. What she was interested in was marine mammals, things like seals. And she found three places in the oceans which were hotspots. And what these had in common was that these hotspots were all located at boundaries between ocean currents. And this seems to be the sort of place that has lots of the plankton that some of these species feed on. So now people who want to protect the species that are endangered need to get as much information as possible. For example, there's an international project called the Census of Marine Life. They've been surveying oceans all over the world, including the Arctic. One thing they found there, which stunned other researchers, was that there were large numbers of species which live below the ice, sometimes under a layer up to 20 metres thick. Some of these species had never been seen before. They've even found species of octopus living in these conditions. And other scientists working on the same project, but researching very different habitats on the ocean floor, have found large numbers of species congregating around volcanoes, attracted to them by the warmth and nutrients there. However, biologists still don't know how serious the threat to their survival is for each individual species. So a body called the Global Marine Species Assessment is now creating a list of endangered species on land 
so they consider things like the size of the population, how many members of one species there are in a particular place, and then they look at their distribution in geographical terms. Although this is quite difficult when you're looking at fish because they're so mobile. And then, thirdly, they calculate the rate at which the decline of the species is happening. So far, only 1,500 species have been assessed, but they want to increase this figure to 20,000. For each one they assess, they use the data they collect on that species to produce a map showing its distribution. Ultimately, they will be able to use these to figure out not only where most species are located, but also where they are most threatened. So, finally, what can be done to retain the diversity of species in the world's oceans? Firstly, we need to set up more reserves in our oceans, places where marine species are protected. We have some, but not enough. In addition. To preserve species such as leatherback turtles, which live out in the high seas but have their nesting sites on the American coast, we need to create corridors for migration, so they can get from one area to another safely. As well as this, action needs to be taken to lower the levels of fishing quotas to prevent overfishing of endangered species. And finally, there's the problem of bycatch. This refers to the catching of unwanted fish by fishing boats. They're returned to the sea, but they're often dead or dying. If these commercial fishing boats used equipment which was more selective, so that only the fish wanted for consumption were caught, this problem could be overcome. Okay. So, does anyone have any questions? That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section four. You will hear part of a lecture to students of architecture about the design of a public building. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. We've been discussing the factors the architect has to consider when designing domestic buildings. I'm going to move on now to consider the design of public buildings, and I'll illustrate this by referring to the new Taylor Concert Hall that's recently been completed here in the city. So, as with a domestic building, when designing a public building, an architect needs to consider the function of the building. For example, is it to be used primarily for entertainment, or for education, or for administration? The second thing the architect needs to think about is the context of the building. This includes its physical location, obviously. But it also includes the social meaning of the building, how it relates to the people it's built for, and finally, for important public buildings, the architect may also be looking for a central symbolic idea on which to base the design, a sort of metaphor for the building and the way in which it is used. 
Let's look at the new Taylor Concert Hall in relation to these ideas. The location chosen was a site in a run-down district that has been ignored in previous redevelopment plans. It was occupied by a factory that has been empty for some years. The whole area was some distance from the high-rise office blocks of the central business district and shopping centre, but it was only one kilometre from the ring road. The site itself was bordered to the north by a canal, which had once been used by boats bringing in raw materials when the area was used for manufacturing. The architect chosen for the project was Tom Harrison. He found the main design challenge was the location of the site in an area that had no neighbouring buildings of any importance. To reflect the fact that the significance of the building in this quite run-down location was as yet unknown, he decided to create a building centred around the idea of a mystery, something whose meaning still has to be discovered. So, how was this reflected in the design of the building? Well, Harrison decided to create pedestrian access to the building and to make use of the presence of water on the site. As people approach the entrance, they therefore have to cross over a bridge. He wanted to give people a feeling of suspense as they see the building first from a distance and then close up. And the initial impression he wanted to create from the shape of the building as a whole was that of a box. The first side that people see the southern wall, is just a high, flat wall uninterrupted by any windows. <laughs> this might sound off-putting, but it supports Harrison's concept of the building, that the person approaching is intrigued and wonders what will be inside. And this flat wall also has another purpose. At night time, projectors are switched on and it functions as a huge screen onto which images are projected. The auditorium itself seats 1,500 people. The floors supported by 10 massive pads. These are constructed from rubber and so are able to absorb any vibrations from outside and prevent them from affecting the auditorium. The walls are made of several layers of honey-coloured wood, all sourced from local beech trees. In order to improve the acoustic properties of the auditorium, and to amplify the sound, they are not straight, they are curved. The acoustics are also adjustable, according to the size of orchestra and the type of music being played. In order to achieve this, there are nine movable panels in the ceiling above the orchestra, which are all individually motorised. And the walls also have curtains, which can be opened or closed to change the acoustics. The reaction of the public to the new building has generally been positive. However, the evaluation of some critics has been less enthusiastic. In spite of Harrison's efforts to use local materials, they criticise the style of the design as being international rather than local and say it doesn't reflect features of the landscape or society for which it is built. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear part of a lecture about factors you should consider when creating advertising materials and the effects they can have on your product sales. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello class and welcome back to Marketing Strategies. This week I will expand upon last week's lecture by talking about factors you should consider when creating advertising materials and the effects they can have on your product sales. Lesson 1. Limit your advertising to the geographic area of your target market. Though you may have a product that people want in a large area, the distance that customers are willing to travel is a significant factor in their choice of where to purchase that product. Take this example. If you're really hungry and decide you want a burrito, would you choose the restaurant that is a block from your apartment or the one that is just as good or even slightly better, across town. Of course, you'd pick the closer restaurant. Next, there's the method of communication to your target market. How do you decide among radio ads, TV commercials, flyers, or even word of mouth? While we often think of the visual presentation of ads, there's much more to advertising than the look. Studies show that consumers are much more likely to remember advertising slogans if there's also a sound plate. Did you know that your sense of smell is closely linked with memory? Think about Mandy's candy store up the road. Every time you walk past it, you can just smell the chocolate, right? I bet you can almost smell it now. Just mentioning the name brings about the smell memory and, in turn, a chocolate craving. What better way to sell chocolate bars? Obviously, sometimes appealing to the senses isn't the most practical way to advertise. For example, it's a good idea to come up with a marketing strategy that adapts to the product, especially digital products. The flexibility of this kind of products is extremely important, so it's very common for advertisers to form one single layout for all of their ads the visual, the medium, even the majority of the content, and simply update the ad each time they come out with a new version. Remember, advertising is all about stirring up the right feeling in your potential customers, whether by stimulating the senses, appealing to the intellect, and so on. Once the customer experiences the ad, the important thing is his or her reaction. Someone could love the ad you made, but unless he or she considers buying the product, you failed to get the reaction you were looking for. So once you have successfully reached your target customer and you have his or her business, often you will want to expand to a larger market. More often than not, the same marketing strategies you used in your small campaign may not work for a larger audience. The larger you scale your product, the more factors you must consider. For instance, Apple operates worldwide, so they must tailor their advertising for each market they enter. Often you'll see Apple ads on international flights that appear not only in English, which is the lingua franca of most regions, but also in the native languages of the majority of passengers. I travelled to Russia last week, and it was really interesting to see the same Nike ad that I've seen a hundred times, except this time it was in Russian. OK, going back to the medium of the advertisement, even after choosing to create print ads instead of radio announcements, television commercials, etc., there is more to consider. If you print your ad in a newspaper, it will be read by a far different audience than if you print your ad in a popular magazine. Would you put an ad for the new Justin Bieber album in a newspaper? Probably not, because that product is most suitable for youths. Let's face it, do you know anyone under the age of 25 that buys a newspaper? No. Now let's try a few strategy exercises. Imagine you're a company that is aiming to improve the environment by making products that reduce human waste. How would you advertise your product? Clearly it would send the wrong message if you put up flyers or other materials that cause lots of waste paper. Consider instead putting commercials on the Health Channel or buying ad space on websites like UNESCO. 
Or here's another example. What is one great place to advertise suntan lotion? How about a swimming pool? It has the exact group of people that need the product. All right, one last thing. Let's say you're filming a commercial for a water filter picture. What would be good scenery to use for the background? Think about somewhere calm and relaxing with clean, fresh water. Can't you see how much more effective a commercial with the beautiful scenery and flowing rivers of a national park would be than, say, water dripping from a tap? So to wrap things up today, think about the geography of your target market, the type of marketing material you should use, and the most effective way to appeal to the customer in order to make a successful ad campaign. That is all I have for you today. Make sure to read through Chapter Eight for Monday. If you have not done so already, okay. Now I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Four. Recording fifty-four. You will hear a lecture about Maori kite making. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Well, good morning, everyone. As you know, we've been looking at different kinds of art and craft that were practiced by the Maori people of New Zealand, at least before the Europeans began to arrive in the eighteenth century. So, the focus of this lecture is kite making, how the kites were made, their appearance, and the purposes they served. Well. Let's start with the way they were made. As with other Maori artistic traditions, kite making involved certain、um, rituals. So, firstly, only priests were allowed to fly and handle the largest, most sacred kites. There were rules too, for the size and scale of the kites that the priests had to follow. And during the preparation of both small and large kites, food was strictly forbidden. In terms of appearance. Kites were frequently designed in the image of a native bird or a Maori god, and sometimes, perhaps less often, a well-known hero. You can imagine that when Maori first arrived in the new country, in New Zealand, it may have taken some time to find suitable materials for their kites. But through trial and error, no doubt, they found plants and trees that provided bark and even roots that they could use to make the frames and wings of their kites. And after the frame had been constructed, the kite then had to be decorated. For this, the priests used long grasses, and these, when the kite was in the air, would stream along behind it. They also used a variety of feathers to add、um, colour to their creations. Well, all this meant it was easy to see a kite in the sky, but you could also hear Maori kites. They could be quite noisy indeed. And this was because some priests liked to hang a long row of shells from the kite. You can imagine how they'd rattle and clatter in the wind, how they might completely capture your attention. As I said before, the most common image was probably a bird, and that's the same for other kite-making cultures. But the kites were designed in particular shapes, so there were kites that were triangular, rectangular, and also shaped like a diamond. And some of them were so large 
it would actually require several men to operate them. Um, some of the kites were also covered in patterns, and to make these patterns, the Maori used different pigments of red and black, and these were either made from a charcoal base or from red-brown clay which had been combined with oil obtained from a local species of shark. Now, before I forget, if you have a chance, do visit the Auckland Museum, because they have the last surviving Birdman kite on display. This is the kind of kite that has a wooden mask at the top of the frame. It's a mask of a human head, and you can clearly see it has a tattoo and also a set of teeth. Quite impressive, and a good example of Maori craftsmanship and symbolism. Right. Turning to the purpose and function of the kites, they certainly had multiple uses. Primarily, the flying of kites was a way of communicating with the gods, and when the kites rose into the air, the Maori used them to deliver messages, perhaps requesting a good harvest, good fortune in war, a successful hunting expedition. So these kites were incredibly valuable to a community, treasured objects that one generation would pass to the next. People would also fly kites for other reasons. For example, to attract the attention of a neighbouring village. This was done when a meeting was required between Maori elders, a convenient method indeed. And finally, when it comes to war, there are traditional stories that describe how when a Maori warrior found himself surrounded by his enemies, a kite could actually provide the possibility of escape. The kites were powerful enough to take a man up into the air. And for this reason, they could also be used to lower him into enemy fortifications, so that an attack could begin from the inside. Well, I'm happy to say there seems to be a revival and growing interest in kite making. And I Recording 58. You will hear a lecture about rock art. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello everyone and welcome. As part of this series of lectures on the development of early humans, today we are looking at rock art, the paintings and drawings produced by prehistoric peoples as they spread across the continents. If you've been lucky enough to look at a piece of rock art close up, you will know it's an experience that makes you wonder about the passage of time and our own history. But rock art also has a practical value for researchers, and let's start by considering why that is. Firstly, it provides vital information about the way that people evolved, information not always easily obtainable from excavated artefacts alone. Secondly, rock art tells us about migration, where people came from and where perhaps they went next. Rock art is found all over the world, and this in itself is not surprising. But what is rather amazing, you might think, is how similar some images are, whether you're looking at a rock face in South Africa or standing inside a cave in Spain. Let me give you an example. When our ancestors drew humans, they would often draw them as stick figures. But if they drew a face, then the eyes were almost always very prominent, very open and wide. 
And of course, animals are very common in rock art. But one animal which is very interesting to researchers is the lizard, because whenever you see a prehistoric painting of one, it's depicted either in profile or looking down on it from above. And these drawings are produced by people of totally different cultural backgrounds. Amazing. But how can this be the case that similar artistic styles exist in such distant locations? In the past, archaeologists believed that trade must have brought people together, and that it gave them the opportunity to observe each other's culture, including art styles. But this didn't prove to be the case. Recently, researchers have come up with a new theory. They believe that the brains of our ancestors evolved to notice certain images before others, and this was important, actually essential, because in an environment full of constant danger, it was necessary for survival. So the need to quickly recognize things that could be helpful or harmful could have had a great influence on rock art, and explain why some images are more common across cultures than others. Later on, there would have been other reasons why communities produced art, certainly for spiritual and social purposes, and no doubt for political ones too. As different tribes looked for allies and struggled against their enemies. Well, as I said before, you can find rock art all over the world, but I'd like to focus now on the rock art of the Aboriginal people of Australia. The images that survive in this part of the world span at least twenty thousand years. In fact, the Aborigines were still practicing this art form in the late eighteenth century when the Europeans began to arrive, and certain images point to the contact between them. For example, the Aborigines began to draw ships which they would have seen along the coast. It's hard for us to imagine what they must have thought when these first began to appear. Another image that is evidence of European arrival is that of horses. An animal that would have been very alien to the Australian landscape.、Um, it isn't actually known how many sites there are across Australia where rock art can be found, but unfortunately, we do know that much of the art is being lost to us. Erosion, of course, is one of the key reasons for its destruction, but human activity is also increasingly responsible. Since the 1960s, industry alone has destroyed around an estimated 10,000 pieces of art. At this rate, in 50 years, half of all Australian rock art could have disappeared for good. Vandalism is sadly another factor, and although most people, I believe, would wish to preserve this art, I'm afraid that tourism is another reason why the art is disappearing. In some cases, the art is damaged when people. Section four. Recording sixty six. You will hear part of a lecture about the history of fireworks in Europe. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. An interesting aspect of fireworks is that their history tells us a lot about the changing roles of scientists and technicians in Europe. 
Fireworks were introduced from China in the 13th century. Up to the 16th century, they were generally used for military purposes, with rockets and fire tubes being thrown at the enemy. But they were also sometimes a feature of plays and festivals, where their chief purpose was related to religion. By the 17th century, the rulers of Europe had started using fireworks as a way of marking royal occasions. Technicians were employed to stage spectacular shows, which displayed aspects of nature, with representations of the sun, snow, and rain. These shows were designed for the enjoyment of the nobility, and to impress ordinary people. But fireworks also aroused the interest of scientists, who started to think of new uses for them. After seeing one firework display where a model of a dragon was propelled along a rope by rockets, scientists thought that in a similar way humans might be able to achieve flight—a dream of many scientists at the time. Other scientists, such as the chemist Robert Boyle, noticed how in displays one firework might actually light another. And it occurred to him that fireworks might provide an effective way of demonstrating how stars were formed. Scientists at the time often depended on the royal courts for patronage, but there was considerable variation in the relationships between the courts and scientists in different countries. This was reflected in attitudes towards fireworks and the purposes for which they were used. In London, in the middle of the 17th century, there was general distrust of fireworks among scientists. However, later in the century, scientists and technicians started to look at the practical purposes for which fireworks might be employed, such as using rockets to help sailors establish their position at sea. It was a different story in Russia. Where the Saint Petersburg Academy of Science played a key role in creating fireworks displays for the court, here those in power regarded fireworks as being an important element in the education of the masses, and the displays often included a scientific message. Members of the academy hoped that this might encourage the royal family to keep the academy open at a time when many in the government. Were considering closing it. In Paris, the situation was different again. The Paris Academy of Sciences played no role in staging fireworks displays. Instead, the task fell to members of the Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture. As in Russia, the work of the technicians who created the fireworks was given little attention. Instead. The fireworks and the spectacle they created were all designed to encourage the public to believe in the supreme authority of the king. However, science was also enormously popular among the French nobility, and fashionable society flocked to demonstrations such as Nicolas Lemery's display representing an erupting volcano. The purpose of scientists was basically to offer entertainment to fashionable society, and academicians delighted in amazing audiences with demonstrations of the universal laws of nature. In the course of the 18th century, the circulation of skills and technical exchange led to further developments. Fireworks specialists from Italy began to travel around Europe, staging displays for many of the European courts. The architect and stage designer Giovanni Servandoni composed grand displays in Paris, featuring colorfully painted temples and triumphal arches. A fireworks display staged by Servandoni would be structured in the same way as an opera. And was even divided into separate acts. Italian fireworks specialists were also invited to perform in London, Saint Petersburg, and Moscow. As these specialists circulated around Europe, they sought to exploit the appeal of fireworks for a wider audience, including the growing middle classes. 
As in the previous century, fireworks provided resources for demonstrating scientific laws and theories, as well as new discoveries. And displays now showed a fascinated public the curious phenomenon of electricity. By the mid 18th century, fireworks were being sold for private consumption. So the history of fireworks shows us the diverse relationships which existed between scientists, technicians, and the rest of society.